We pay our respects to the Yagera and Turbal people, custodians of this land, Mianjin, and recognize the value that they bring to this country. Always was, always will be. Woo! Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, TDC Brisbane. Matt, thanks for the hustle and bringing everybody in. Um, <laughs> hello to everybody watching this at home. Hello, Night Jars at home in the studio. Uh, don't forget to put on the alarm when you leave tonight. Um, we are the three founders of Night Jar. Christine, Ahmed, and Bonnie. So it's day two today, and Matt's brief was to be honest. Um, that TDC is a chance for us to be vulnerable about failures as well as successes. So while we're being honest, I'm feeling a lot of emotions right now, <laughs> and also while we're being raw, the prezzo you're about to see is much more raw than we would actually like it to be. <laughs> Uh, we've had illness and injury rip through the studio in the past month. We've had a shaving accident um, just <laughs> earlier. En route. Um, en route. Um, <laughs> and as Murphy's Law would have it, we've been busier than we've ever been. That's just how things happen, and it's, nothing's ever perfect, though, um, as Ahmed can always attest well, we're to. We're always trying. Always nothing's trying. ever perfect. <laughs> They also told us it was going they to be very tricky to, to They told us to be three. close, but not too close. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always hard to do things as a three, but we don't ever like to do what's easy at night, Jars. So. Um, and also a big congratulations to everybody who's already been up on stage and presented and will do so tomorrow. It's, um, it's quite nerve-wracking, so whatever obstacles you're battling to get up on stage, um, congrats. And thank you very much to Matt for this opportunity. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. So who are we? Night Jar is an experienced design company. We're based in leafy and lovely Surrey Hills, that's us, upstairs, conveniently located above a coffee shop. Um, and we're very excited to be here in sunny Brisbane. Here's our team. Oh, this screen's so big, I can't see it all. Right. Uh, our passion is emerging of meticulous design and forward-thinking tech to help our clients hit their goals and creating products that we too are also proud of. We build brands and digital products for enterprise-level companies all the way down to small and energetic startups and we do it at speed. There's a lot of different industries in that list. Um, the common thread between them all is really the, the belief that they can change the status quo of their business through design and technology. Um, we also love working with clients that have a confusing acronym that seems to be um, a prerequisite now for <laughs> new clients. So if there's anyone out there with a confusing acronym, come on over. So who brings all our magic to life? Our amazing team and we'd be nothing without them. We're small but mighty, and we've spent six years growing and hiring only the most passionate and creative and caring people. Above all, they love a laugh, which is what makes going to the studio a joy every day. I know the general notion is not to think of your team as family, but we do respect each other, and we enjoy each other's company. <laughs> it's actually how we started at NYCHA. We had three friends who enjoyed each other's company that started a company. And two of us decided we might have a baby as well together. <laughs> so, particularly family as well. That's not the baby. <laughs> That's not the baby. <laughs> or is it? I mean, I would love that baby. <laughs> so, um, let me show you what our 15 humans and one griffin are capable of.
you. <laughs> that song's almost as good the 8,000th time that you hear it. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk to you about value in its various guises and what it means to each of us and why it's important that you know your value. So I am head of experience strategy. So for me, value lies in the outcomes we deliver for the humans that we're designing for. When you focus on the user um, and see things from their perspective, you'll deliver something meaningful that answers a real need. And I'm Ahmed, I'm head of design and technology. And for me, value lies in the delight our products bring to our end users and the scalability for our clients. We hold ourselves up to a very high standard at Niger. Uh, to do the best work that we can, not just for our clients, but for ourselves as designers and technologists. And I'm Christine, I'm Managing Director at NYTRA, and for me, commercial value is understanding the impact we deliver for our clients and being fairly compensated for that. For me, our focus at NYTRA is ensuring everybody in the team understands what value is and how we communicate that. We are relatively unique in that we come as a three, and we're two-thirds female-owned. In a perfect world, when our three disciplines work together, as I said, in a perfect world, um, by our powers combined, this is where we create the most impactful work with the most enjoyable process. So Bon, Chris, and I work so well together because we have these complementary strengths. That leaves us to think that value uh, is, is from a different lens. So the best partnerships that we believe are not the ones that work in silos, but where they overlap like a Venn diagram. Bon made me put this in. <laughs> <laughs> I do love a Venn. Most importantly, we wholeheartedly believe in the value that each of our disciplines brings to the Nightjar business and our clients. So first of all, strategic value. How does Nightjar add strategic value across all of our projects? So there are some core beliefs which we try to live by, and spoiler alert, they are not rocket science. Um, but you'd be surprised how often they get forgotten in the busy day-to-day -day of studio life. So first of all, design without strategy is just decoration. So this is a lovely little product image from Katerina Camprani called The Uncomfortable, and it's basically a series of whole objects uh, designed without strategy behind them. So strategy can be a very overused word, but essentially it means a long-term plan to create sustainable value. We're not here to sell a quick fix uh, or something that our clients don't need. We're here to solve problems by understanding real user needs. Clients come to us wanting change. And we need to understand where we're coming from, where we're going to, how we're going to get there, and how we measure it along the way. So that's what a strategy is. To ensure that we're not just decoration, we need to ask questions about the intention of our design. This is such a big screen. So is our design communicating a message? Is it enhancing user experience? Is it increasing a conversion metric, such as sales or inquiries or registrations? Um, or is it reducing the time taken to perform a task? So without a blueprint that we're going to measure things by, we won't know when we've succeeded or if we make, need to make changes in order to actually succeed. We have such an incredible privilege working in design in that the work that we do has the ability to transform processes, tools, and behaviors to shape lives for the better. Hundreds, if not millions, of people use all of our products, interact with our brands, and watch our content. It's a form of power we need to treat with deference and respect. To waste these opportunities with work that never reached its potential because it's not driven by outcomes is a terrible tragedy. If design does not serve a purpose, it's wallpaper. Number two. I love this one. You are not the target audience. Human-centered design is quite simple, and it's not necessarily new, and it's been very well documented by a lot of people much more intelligent than myself. However, sometimes our clients want to circumvent this step because, well, that step where we actually speak to human beings, and because they think that they already know what these humans are going to say. But without understanding the real problems that people face, that we uncover by talking to them, how will we even know how we're going to solve these problems? So strategy is about uncovering problems as much as finding solutions. The best part of my role, what I really, really love, is the qualitative research with the people who we are designing the products for. It's incredibly humbling to step inside someone else's world, even if it's only for 60 minutes, to understand the struggles a young single mum who may have called Lifeline in the past is going through, or the pressure a trans teenager is feeling at school, and trying to figure out how we might help them. 
It's also fascinating to hear perspectives that you might never have considered before. So venture capitalists, acoustic engineers, dentists, pram designers, plum growers. I've spoken to a lot of people in my time. Having these interactions breaks you out of your own narrow mindset and opens you up to so many possibilities. It's a constant reminder that we're not always the target audience, and that is really invaluable. I actually listened to a really great podcast yesterday. This guy, Kevin Kelly, he's the founder of Wired magazine, and he talked a lot about your importance to cultivate that um, ability to think differently. Um, in this world today, when we're increasingly connected, we're all doing the same things, watching the same things, talking about the same things. Your ability to think differently is actually your point of difference, and that's where innovation comes from. So putting yourself in someone else's shoes, um, if only for a moment, really helps you to um, cultivate this ability to think differently. And lastly for me, ask the dumb questions. So, strategy is such a huge, all-encompassing, scary word that when I first started out in this business, I thought I needed to have all the answers. But actually, there's power in admitting that you don't know it all. We work across so many different clients, across so many different industries, as you saw before. They all have very different audiences with very different problems to solve. So every project actually does demand that we start with fresh eyes. Asking questions stimulates your critical thinking muscles. It forces you to analyze other perspectives because you're not the target audience. And asking questions helps keep you accountable because the more information you have, the more tightly you can hone your metrics for success, which is really what design is about, having a strategy behind it. Curiosity is also what keeps us creative. So ask all the questions that you may have thought were dumb because that's actually what's going to help you shape the most impactful work. Speaking of impactful work. Thank you, Vaughn. So, onto the creative lens. So, for Nightjar, we add creative value through design and technology. And really, I don't live by rules, but if I had to pick a few, here's what I'm thinking this week. Well, just today. Maybe, maybe. today. Yeah. Just since we'd submitted the <laughs> keynote. Which you already wanted to make changes to. Um, so, I actually walk past this poster every day. It's put in my shop window in my neighborhood, and it hits me every time. If you want to achieve greatness, um, stop asking for permission. We do this so often, we hold ourselves back, we don't allow our voice or our ideas or our values or leadership qualities to come through. If you don't feel comfortable speaking up to your leaders or out to your peers, you probably haven't found your tribe. I've tried many times in various agencies, big, small, to bring change from the middle up with little effect. And Ahmed definitely feels comfortable speaking up <laughs> <laughs> nowadays. It was only when I decided to stop asking permission to do the work that I believed in, that I found I made a difference again. So, be the authority on your work, make sure you give it your voice, see it through, and don't let it get watered down. My second point is to try everything twice. Might be bad advice, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's advice I've tried. There are many hats that you can wear in the agency world, and I've tried them all on, some more than others. Some didn't fit me well the first time, the next it was quite snug. What I'm trying to say is that you won't realize your full potential unless you've understood what you're passionate about. And in that space, hopefully you'll find compassion for yourself. I started as a software engineer. My background is from computer science. I've also been a UX designer, a UI designer, a brand designer, a project manager. That hat was a bit tight. <laughs> Strategist, <laughs> no <surprises for> <laughs> creative, an art director, creative director, design director, technical director. Many directors. Many team directors. directors. I'm <laughs> happy to take a passenger seat again now. Um, but it's okay not to be certain about your path from the beginning. Getting to know the different disciplines is challenging, and it makes whatever direction you eventually do choose to go even more enlightening, and makes the work stronger. Recently, I removed all my hats and put a new one on. I'm now head of innovation. Uh, I'm stepping down from design because um, I'm letting my team lead this forward. Sometimes you have to recognize when your team have fancier hats than you do. <laughs> That's a fancy hat. <laughs> So, lead by example. Um, creativity is quite the enigma, as, I, as you all know. It's hard to put a direct value on something that's incredibly elusive. At NYCHA, we have such high standards in design and technology, and we want our clients to value this too. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's crucial as a creative, as a technologist, as a strategist, to be able to articulate your ideas firstly and effectively to your teammates, and then to your clients, and position yourself as the experts. We all know the process of creativity can be a messy one. So, to get results, I find it best to isolate yourself, hone in on your idea and, uh, that you're trying to convey. I always find that ideas are a dime a dozen and that execution is key. 
When you have an idea, solidify it, write it out, sketch it out, create a prototype. Only then let the feedback process begin. Collectively as a team, we go back and forth with each other on an idea, experimenting, trying, manipulating as much as we can before it, the craft begins. Tell you what, though, half the time, I'm using wild gestures, <laughs> sound effects to explain the ideas, which is why you need to really hone in with your team. Sometimes they just get you from a sound effect. And the more quality time you spend with them, the better the work becomes. So go for that coffee, go for that lunch, switch your positions, sit with your teammates, and magic will happen. It's a language we've learned to understand, Ahmed speaking with his hands. <laughs> <laughs> And true value is in transformation. We really believe that at Nightjar for our clients. It's, it comes down to the collective responsibility of the team to push the work where the client's business as a whole should be. Subjectivity can lead, and, and design by committee can lead to watered down work and diluted work. It kind of misses the mark. It's a disservice to your client and yourself as a designer or technologist to get, the, uh, to get it right. And it's really hard. Sometimes feedback makes the work more powerful if the client understands their, their, their business, of course, and their users. Um, but if, as long as they let you take the creativity forward. I always find it great with feedback is that if you, you look at it, sleep on it, come back in fresh, and then you see how your thoughts have changed around the matter. It is our job to question everything and set the tone right at the beginning. So you're only doing the right thing, so that we're only doing the right thing to bring about change for our clients. My job is to ultimately transform not just how our communi clients communicate in market, but also how we have build that vehicle for growth. So the underpinning technology has to be pushed too. In order to deliver that experience for our customers that they demand, sometimes it means uncomfortable periods of change for clients to get the best result, but it's always worth it, worthwhile. And to get the best results, <laughs> we need to get the commercials right. <laughs> so I'm going to share some of... Um, what we sometimes refer to as the boring parts, which I'm hoping maybe some of you can find something enlightening or insightful to take away from today. Uh, from the outset, we knew we wanted to be different. We wanted to establish some guiding principles that would set us apart and set some guardrails for all of our important decisions to make. Particularly important when you're three people as well, not just a, a one, one person's shop. Um, this often meant saying no, more often than saying yes. Again, not easily done. For example, when considering if a client is right for night job, we ask ourselves a bunch of questions. Are we going to be able to deliver a meaningful impact? Are there, are the, is the organisation setting long-term brand goals? Otherwise, we might be creating something that doesn't stand the test of time. When the going gets tough, are these people going to be fun to spend times in the trenches with? Which, of course, the times do get tough. <laughs> does, it, does their organisation foster a blameless culture like ours does? Um, it goes without saying that this is an important one. There's been many times where we've ignored our intuition and have only come to regret it. Um, do they see us as an expert or a supplier? Do they refer to us as an expert or a supplier? Being treated like an expert versus a supplier is very different. It might seem like a small nuance, but it can have fundamental um, impact to the functions of the relationship. Um, will we learn something new? Are we going to be able to leverage emerging technology? Are we going to be able to push the creative? These are particularly important questions here because it's a vital part of our retention strategy. Um, everybody that works at Nightjar wants to work on future-facing tech, basically exclusively, um, which is also not easy, and deliver world-class design only. During the dark times, we've had to <laughs> talk very long and hard about <laughs> and remind ourselves that it's better to be happy and poor. Mm -hmm. Money is important, but it's not everything. After selecting the right clients for Nightjar, the second most important part of my role is pricing. I've been practicing pricing for my entire career, and I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been trying to make it more creative, more collaborative, more data-driven, and we get it right so often still. I think you'll find we get it wrong, wrong. so often. So. Oh, wrong. Did I just say it right? We, we get it wrong. Right. I wish we got it right. I wish we got it right more often. <laughs> My goodness. 
<laughs> that's, yeah, that's the irony of it. <laughs> yeah, we, we get it wrong so often. Um, most of the stress in our lives is caused by things that we don't do. And I found that I was bringing my own reluctance to talk about money to client conversations around budget. Uh, I would labor on that and, and be, yeah, not do a night drive to service by not talking about compensation openly and upfront. So I've learned to lean into this and start talking about compensation right, 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 up, right, right out the gate. <clears throat> Given what we do is so highly customized, it's a very tricky art to get right every time. Yes, we do get it wrong so many times still. <laughs> we often, I often wonder how we're still here today. <laughs> um, we ask our clients to take a fairly large leap of faith with us when they start out on the night drive journey and trust that we're going to deliver exponential value with their budget and treat it with a great deal of respect. This takes a lot of conversations. But it means we're not scoping out every minute detail of the project at the beginning, and it creates space for both Nightjar and the client to refine the scope as we go. We also have a minimum level of engagement, which can help begin those awkward compensation price conversations respectfully. We've lost more profit on jobs that I care to think about, which goes back to my point about not getting it right. Sorry. <laughs> not getting it right. Because we have consistently under-communicated the value we have delivered. Under-communicated the value we have delivered. And we've been too shy to ask for the compensation we deserve. It's taken us years to have the courage to stand up for our worth. Being two-thirds female-owned has also often worked against us where we felt bullied into settling for less. Although we're still working on this, earning profit is actually the only way to be responsible and reliable for your clients over the long haul. <laughs> I thought we'd labor on that point there. <laughs> yes. That's the standing ovation. She thought she might get a standing ovation. I said, so <laughs> there should be a standing ovation for that point alone, right? <laughs> no, other, no other industry does it, so why do we? Why do we? With the exclusion of government and paid proposals, we don't pitch. Our industry is rife with pitching, as you all know. Um, it's a toxic culture for team morale, pushes existing client bookings out, means late nights and weekends to fit it in, and it's a huge amount of wasted work and always puts the winning agency on the back foot in the relationship anyway. We're trying to break this mold. We're clear when RFPs come in that we don't have a standard rate card, which comes as much of a shock to, to new clients, um, that we don't do creative or technical proposals for free. We're happy to provide our creds some references, and let the body of our work do the talking. This is about claiming our status as the experts and believing that the work that we deliver is impactful and of oh, value. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to change this awful practice and focus on what really matters. Spending time getting to know our clients' business and diagnosing their needs properly. As Ahmed loves to remind us, it's not a deadline if no one is dying. Although I've wanted all the to time. kill Ahmed many times. <laughs> yeah, we've wanted to I'm, kill Ahmed a few times. I'm the only on my deathbed. <laughs> <laughs> Deadlines are usually arbitrary, made up by somebody somewhere in a room, and flexibility can be built into the timeline so that we're protecting the process and our people. If we're not ready for an upcoming delivery, which is pretty often, <laughs> <laughs> we're honest about why and we reschedule what we can in reason, uh, within reason to protect our team and ensure the quality of our output doesn't suffer. Because we all know that's incredibly stressful too, presenting something we're not proud of. We practice good meeting hygiene. We're very particular about who is in which meeting. We respect each other's need for deep flow and we have three meeting-free days per week with dedicated quiet studio times and work from home days. 
We generally don't work past 6 p.m., but if we rarely do, those hours are given back to the team in lieu immediately. Nightjar is a team of incredibly talented humans. While we're endlessly passionate about delivering perfection every single day, we realize there are only so many hours. We're okay with the painful truth that we may never reach our full potentials as thinkers, makers, doers, as we all have other meaningful potentials to live up to outside the studio. Obviously, one has to put on their mo oxygen mask first, but once you have, it's time to think about giving back. From the outset, we committed to having a number of social enterprises and not-for-profit um, organisations on the roster at NYTRA so that we could give back to the world around us. We have given as much of our time and expertise as possible to a wonderful organisation such as Australian Literacy and Numeracy Foundation, uh, another acronym, ALNF. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right, nailed it. <laughs> Lifeline, Never Not Creative, another acronym, Reach Out, <laughs> Too Good, and Women for Change. Seeing the tangible impact we have on real people's lives is heartwarming and keeps us motivated through the difficult days, times, difficult times. Now we'll take you through some projects that demonstrate our learnings from the strategic, creative, and commercial perspective. Kicking off is Lifeline. Lifeline. Although we strive to create impact with every project that we work on, it's humbling when the work we're doing is actually literally saving lives. Lifeline is a client that we've worked with for many years, and it's one where empathy must always come first. We leave all our creative ego at the door. This is a project not driven by clever transitions or WebGL effects. This is a project where understanding the audience's needs can literally be the difference between life and death. Every year, over one million people reach out to Lifeline for support. The crisis supporters who are answering the phones give referrals to mental health support options such as clinics, shelters and other helplines, and they give their time freely, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so that no one has to go through their darkest moments alone. However, the online system that the crisis supporters used to find these referrals was so clunky and difficult to search that each centre actually just had a paper version of a little flippy-dippy, they called them, sitting next to the phones because they couldn't use the online system. So we went out and we sat with many of these crisis supporters at the call centres and through understanding their work, their context, their own feelings of panic and failure when they weren't able to find a, a referral for someone in need on the other end of the phone, uh, we were able to create a digital replacement for the antiquated paper-based system. And the new digital system, by understanding their needs thoroughly, uh, was modelled from their existing behaviour and the tool was intuitive and then onboarding time was minimal. As a suicide prevention service, Lifeline's metrics of impact are not tied to sales or profit share, uh, but they're measured by how we might uh, create a better and safer future for our fellow humans. The efficiency, which the new tool that we created um, enables the crisis supporters to find and share support services, it reduces the time spent on the call, increases the potential of number of people that they can help, which is one of Lifeline's key performance indicators. KBI acronym. <laughs> and another action. Oh, okay. uh, I just wanted to jump here as well and add a little point about how you know, Nightjar are incredibly passionate about creating better futures for people and planet. And it goes without saying that collaborating with social enterprises gives everybody in the team an opportunity to make a positive, positive difference in the global community. Without a doubt, this leads to greater job satisfaction and team morale. And when we have social work running, social enterprise work, running through the studio, you can really see the team rally behind the cause, and that's just an awesome thing. Mm. Mm. Now, over to Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, we also work with large enterprise clients too. Uh, this is a project we just recently launched, soft launched, and it was to create a new model to destroy the old one. <laughs> we work with an, an innovation team within Pernod Ricard where we created a new brand from scratch to appeal to a target audience in record time. The brief was to ban a convention. They didn't want a traditional e-com store for their new fine wines platform. So as you can see, it was a bit of glitz and glam on this one, but it was bringing content and commerce together in a very unique format. We had permission to move away from their globally mandated tech stack, which was incredible. We had spent a lot of time with their team to make sure this was possible, uh, to deliver something modern, scalable for the future, and, and deliver across all new markets. 
Our client was truly collaborative. We never launched a brand so quickly, and still able to keep the detail and craft that we craved. We worked closely to build trust with the new, and the new stack that we proposed it would not only suit the national market, but have international growth as well, so that the entire Perno team across the globe could take it on. We designed a platform that puts focus on content for commerce while still creating a frictionless experience to transact. And we only launched with the necessary features. As a team, we were able to put forward the most valuable utility for the user, plus a bit of glitz and a, and a beautiful WebGL engine power too. So the temptation to bloat was very high, yeah. though. So. I had to throw some 3D in there. <laughs> <laughs> and now over to Chris, to a very trusting client. Yes, this one it was an epic project in every sense of the word. Decor Systems is a 40-year-old family-run acoustic panelling company based in the suburbs of Sydney. And from the very first meeting, we knew this was going to be a special opportunity. The Decor Systems team's values were very much lined with, in line with ours. When we visited their meticulous factory, it was clear they delivered a high-quality product. It's just that their branding and digital presence was letting them down. So this project called for a total rebrand to appeal to their desired audience top-tier architects, and a new digital platform to, pla uh, to power their growth. We've been lucky to have a couple of clients at Nightjar who have trusted us explicitly and given us complete autonomy. It's rare when it happens, but when it does, how good. <laughs> it's these relationships that have resulted in the most impactful work. Decor Systems were one of the best examples of that. <clears throat> The commercial impact the brand and the platform had on the Decor Systems business was nothing short of spectacular. They were now able to appeal to a whole new audience of top-tier architects, um, be specified on top-tier builds, use the platform as a powerful sales, sales tool, streamline their sampling process, and recruit the highest caliber of salespeople. Finally, they were also able to reduce their environmental impact through less printed collateral and digital renders of their products. They're now looking at opening a new factory to meet the demand. Big thanks to Decor Systems for trusting us and empowering us to deliver exponential value for you. Um, we are, when, when you're in a relationship where no one is scared to take a calculated risk, and to trust the experts, that's where the magic really happens. So, what have we learned? Time to wrap up. Here are the three most important things we've learned along the way on this little adventure that is Nightjar. First of all, give a shit. Don't be indifferent. Don't take things at face value. You need to care about the problems you're solving and how you're going to measure your results. Be invested and ask all the dumb questions. When you're passionate about something, it comes through in the work. Talk about compensation up front. Don't discount, de-scope. Uh, no free work, no pitching. At all costs, protect yourself, your people in the process. And always find a way to give back to the world around you. We're all responsible for leaving the world in a better place than we found it. <laughs> and finally, find your tribe. Um, I've been searching for belonging all my life. I'm sure many people have. Uh, I never felt like I fit in. Um, I'm sure many people in this audience feel that way at times. Looking at the starting point of, of, of my career, um, the one advice for the creative value is to find your tribe. Once you do, everything will become clear, creativity will flow, your life will expand, your successes will feel right, and the balance will arrive in your life. For me, I was stumbling into Chris and Bon, two exceptional leaders oh. that keep me on my toes <laughs> no. every day, and a team that is pure magic. Every single night, I was full of creativity, heart, and honesty. Behind the work, they bring a sense of levity and humor <laughs> to the studio, and it reminds me every day that we're only going to get better. That is a very big... Beautiful. That was only just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> that was just the other day. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.